Okay, I'm gonna get started. It is good? Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Rocklin. I work for Anaconda. Anaconda was previously known as Continuum Analytics. Uh, and Anaconda does many things, consulting services, enterprise software, training. We also write open source software, either grant funded or just by you know, good of our hearts. Uh, and this is about that. So I work on the open source side of the company, more, research, more researchy side. Uh, I usually work on a library called Dask for parallel, com for parallel and distributed computing. Uh, this talk is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be about uh, streaming processing mostly. Uh, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about Dask. It's mostly going to be about APIs for streaming processing in Python and how we might build those. Briefly though, just to sort of give you some more context about Dask. So who here has heard of Dask? Okay, who here has heard more about maybe Dask data frame, a big parallel pandas, versus uh, you know, Dask delayed, Dask task scheduling kinds of things. So pandas people or NumPy people, and then task scheduling people, way fewer of those people. But actually the task scheduling people are, are probably the more common active users. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a situation that comes up a lot in my life. So I have here a little Dask cluster on my lo local machine. On the left, I have a JupyterLab notebook. And on the right, I have uh, the Dask dashboard. I have a few functions which do sort of trivial amounts of work and sleep to simulate work. These might be functions in your world, but you know, maybe they're loading data, maybe they're processing data, maybe they're training models. I can run them locally, or I can use Dask to run them on a cluster instead. Now to be clear, Dask isn't paralyzing individual calls of these functions. They're just running them on some core on my, on my remote machine. So I've run, instead of calling increment locally on one, producing the value two, I can then submit, I can instead use Dask to submit that as a future. So the concurrent <laughs> futures API, it's standard in Python 3, a variety of products implemented. And that future is kind of like a pointer. It's pointing to remote data somewhere else on my machine or on other machines. I can get back the results if I want to. Going through this fast, don't worry about it. This is just sort of giving you context if you happen to know Dask. Now, this becomes a lot more useful if you combine with for loops, where I can submit you know, hundreds of these tasks per second, and the various cores on my local computer can crunch on these tasks in parallel. So on the right here, you're seeing all of my cores, you know, compute on increment, compute on double, et cetera. I can add in a few more workers there. So this is on my local machine, but you can imagine it happening on a cluster. Maybe, you know, I scale up my cluster a little bit, and now I have, I have more computing power. So Dask has a few APIs to do generic parallel processing. And these can be uh, fairly time reactive. So you can submit tasks, you know, separate, you know, submit a thousand tasks, wait for the first 10 to arrive, look at those results, cancel the rest, add more, et cetera. Dask is actually quite flexible. So people use it to parallelize NumPy and Pandas. And those things are built on top of what I'm showing here. But you know, in many companies, people use Dask or in algorithmic research, people use Dask to parallelize other stuff. And this is that other stuff component. And Dask is not, you know, do my big data frame computation. It's, I've got a bunch of things you should run. It depends on each other. Please compute those things for me. And we can build a variety of things on top of that. So one of those things, I'm gonna close this down now. And that's the last of Dask we're gonna see for a little bit. One of those things that people often ask me to, to parallelize is streaming processing. So what do I mean by streaming processing? So Streaming data, there's a variety of talks on streaming systems. Uh, I think of Flink or Beam or Apache Spark uh, or Storm. Streaming data sets are unbounded, meaning they might continue forever. Uh, common examples are things like web server logs. For as long as people click on your website, you're gonna get more and more data. Um, you know, financial time series, you know, the, the stock markets continue going. Uh, they're also timely. Uh, we're operating on them in a streaming way because we wanna react to new events when they happen. Maybe we're interested in credit card fraud. We notice a lot of credit card is doing a lot of activity that's odd. We want to respond to that you know, within seconds or minutes so we reduce the amount of fraud that happens in the future. So both handling things in an unbounded way, so we can't ask for the sum or the number of elements in a data set, that number is infinite. And also ha responding to things in a timely way. So as they occur, we want to respond. And those are sort of the two things we think about when doing uh, streaming processing. Uh, as another example of that, one of my favorite examples of streaming data is one that you have on your computer. Uh, you should never do what I'm about to do. This is a massive security violation. Um, uh, but I'm actually gonna look at all the packets flowing through my network router using TCP dump. 
So you actually see the, uh, the source IP and the source port and the destination IP and the destination port along with how many bytes were in the packet, et cetera. And if I, if I go to a website, this will actually be fairly active. Um, now what we want is we want to turn this stream of data Uh, into uh, into some sort of you know dashboard that we can analyze better, you know some sort of system that we can look at and feel feel happy about. Uh, so I you know I built a little system to do this, a sort of a weekend project, an afternoon project, um, and it looks like this. So here's that same stream of data coming through, and we, you know we're doing various histograms of the source and destination port and IP. Uh, the, de the ports often correspond to services. So for example, HTTPS is on 443, and so all of the time that I'm, say, going to a service like Microsoft, uh, our generous hosts for today, uh, that's all coming on HTTP. And so I've selected that here, and this is now the sub-selection of all the things that just have port 443. So this is, this is the goal of, of my talk, to build libraries that allow people to build systems like what I just built here. Uh, Streaming data is streaming network data is one such example, but presumably in organizations you can think of other examples that are of relevance to your field. So uh, this was about 180 lines when I first built it. I think it's now about down to 100. So we're making these things easier and easier to build. So it's using Bokeh and a small library I'm talking about today called Streams. So let's stop uh, violating security issues. Okay, uh, so you've seen that. Uh, these slides are online. If you go to my Twitter account, M. Rocklin, R-O-C-K-L-I-N, uh, the slides are there, and there's links to the slides and also notebooks that you'll see. So uh, we are reinventing a wheel. Let us acknowledge that. Uh, there are many projects that are very mature that do streaming data processing. Libraries like Apache Flink are very well respected, both by users and by technologists. Also Spark Streaming, Beam, Storm. These generally come out of sort of the big data space. And they're very, very good at handling standard case streaming processing systems that occur commonly when you know, managing web logs. Slightly more complex systems, if you sort of go outside of what those systems are built for, you might use systems like ZeroMQ or Akka um, or a variety of other systems that exist. Uh, I also want to point people to ReactiveX or the sort of reactive programming generally, which, so this is a, this is a UI framework and even though it's not about data processing so much, it still has the same flavor of reacting to events like mouse clicks or things like that and taking events as they occur. Uh, and so uh, reactive programming and UI and streaming pro processing actually look somewhat similar. What we're going to talk about today is sort of a blend of those two. So again, we're reinventing a wheel. This started off as an educational project for me to understand how streaming processing systems worked. Uh, built it a few times and rebuilt it. It sort of now feels pleasant enough to share with people. But that's for you to decide. So please, I would appreciate feedback after the talk. Anytime, tell me if I'm wasting my time. So I have a library called Streams with a Z. Uh, and Streams is different from the others, and it's, it's Pythonic. So it's actually fairly rare to find a good streaming data processing system in Python. Uh, it's very simple in the simple cases. Uh, it actually, everything I'm going to show you today runs just in a local thread. Um, except in the end, we'll use Dask. Uh, it's also fairly complex, so we can get complex if we want to be. And it integrates, as we'll see, nicely to things like Jupyter and Pandas. Uh, final disclaimer, everything in stock is experimental. APIs are subject to change uh, without notice. I get emails from people years later about YouTube talks complaining why things don't work. So YouTube people, this is for you. Don't expect this to work in the next, in the next year. Um, that being said, this is also being used in production, uh, not in production, but it's being used in active research. Uh, so it, it does work in a nice way. So we'll see a few things. Uh, I'll talk about Stream's core, basic streaming primitives. We'll then marry that to Pandas and get a streaming data frame. Then we'll marry that to Dask and get streaming distributed Pandas data frames. So uh, I'm actually gonna switch out of slides and go to examples for a bit. Uh, is this font legible in the back? Okay. That's sort of a yeah kind of, okay, great. Okay, so let's, let's make a stream. I've made a stream. Uh, and I can do something simple like, like push data into that stream. Okay. That didn't do anything, because that stream is just taking that data and then sending it out. Nothing is actually being attached to that stream to do any action. So let's make some functions that do some things. I can make a function like ink, function like double. 
Uh, these are about, sort of really, really simple, and we get more complex as we go along. So let's make a couple of streams, stream.map ink, and then we'll, maybe we'll print. Let's also double that. That again hasn't done anything. We haven't pushed any data through our stream yet. But let's go ahead and do that. Let's maybe change it to 10. Okay. So I pushed data into the input part of my stream. That number 10 was, we added one to it. We multiplied it by two. We then printed both results and we got these results printed to the screen. So our stream looks a little bit like this. So it's a pipeline. On the one side, we push in data. On the right side, we do things to that data. And Streams is tracking how that data moves throughout that pipeline. This is a very simple pipeline. In practice, they look much more complex. So let's look at something slightly less simple. Let's say that I had some data, to, some function to create some, some JSON data. So this is just random data, and it produces a string, which you know, is like a string you might find coming out of a, you know, some sort of device. It's got a name, it's got a value, has a time. Now, I'm going to make a stream that we're going to use to process that, that data, and we're going to first parse that. So records equals source.map json.loads. Then we might also maybe make a separate stream of names. That's again feeding off of records. Okay. So now I'm going to push some data into that stream. And we'll see is that all of my streams just emitted the, the most recent value that they've just seen. So let's do that a few more times. So we have these three objects, source, records, and names, which are just getting streams of values, and we've shaped how those values look. Okay. Now, I can sit here you know, with a for loop, or you know, I maybe I have some, some system that's running all the time and pushing new data into that. Maybe I'm watching Kafka or something. Uh, or here, I'm just going to make a little uh, async coroutine that's going to add data into that run 10 times a second. And we now have these streams that are, that are processing for us. Okay. So you know, we've got this. This thing names, we might make names.map length. So now we'll get a new stream, which is uh, the number of letters in that name. Okay. So relatively simple. These are relatively simple streams. Uh, we're seeing nice integration with Jupyter here. So we're used to seeing you know, single outputs out of Jupyter, like one plus one, get a static result out. Now all of our results are themselves dynamic changing things that evolve over time. Okay. okay. Uh, map is relatively simple. We might want to do something more complex that requires some state. We might want to, for example, sum up all of the x values in these records. Okay. So again, we can't ask for the sum of the entire stream because that's infinite, but we can ask for the sum of the values that we've seen so far. So uh, we use sort of the standard uh, binary operators in reduce trick, if you've seen that. To make a, make a function, it's a binary operator. It takes some previous total and some new value. I'm just going to turn those. And we'll take records. We will map out the x value. And we'll accumulate uh, this binary operator with a starting value of 0. Again, it's just a, a rolling, rolling addition. So these are the two most simple operations you could use when, when building up streaming operations. There's no syntactic sugar here, but this allows you to build things in a nice way. Uh, here's a more complex accumulator, which is adding up all of the number of times we've seen each name. Okay. So, let's see that all briefly again in slide form. Here's map. Map takes in a stream of things and it produces a new stream of things with that function applied. Here's accumulate, takes in a stream of things, it takes in a function and some previous state and it emits out new things that have that state accumulated to it. It is similar to reduce, from map filter reduce, uh, but it operates in more of a rolling way. Uh, uh, for a lot of this, you could use Python iterators. Right? You could use generator expressions and they would work. Uh, well, that becomes a little bit messy is when you start branching out your streams or joining them. It becomes quite difficult to, to manage how to, how to pull from all of your iterators in a consistent way. Streams manages that for you. So it's very easy to branch streams into many streams. 
we're seeing that here, right? We're pushing in only in one part of the stream, but many things are coming out. Many of our plots are updating. Or you can imagine joining them. You might have different uh, things in your system that are updating at different times. Maybe you have data being shoved in your system that's being predicted against some scikit-learn model, but actually periodically you update your scikit-learn model. So it's also a stream that's also going to be changing. You want to have that all whole system updating. So you can imagine also joining systems in various ways. The streams provide some essence to do those. Uh, there are many other operations. I'm showing you the very simple things. Uh, also common when dealing with streaming systems is dealing with uh, different flow rates. So in this example, we have a couple of streams where the user is maybe they're, you know, they're just shoving data in as fast as they can. Maybe at, at the end of our stream, maybe this is some sort of write to database operation. And maybe that's going to be a little bit slower, right? Maybe some sort of asynchronous system. So if that's slow, we might run into a problem where all of our data builds up at that part of the pipeline. And we actually want to tell our user to slow down. You know, this is, you're going too fast. And so streams integrates with Tornado. So as you're sending data forward in the stream, streams is sending back Tornado futures. And you can wait on those futures until things are, are happy and done. If you don't know Tornado or async programming, um, that's totally fine. Uh, the Streams API is intended to work in a synchronous way as well. So you don't have to think about this at all. Streams will handle it for you. You can also artificially add things like rate limiters or buffers. Maybe you know some API can only be hit, you know, a thousand times an hour. Maybe you know that, you know, this particular spot in the pipeline is actually very cheap to have data build up, and that's fine. So uh, there's a variety of mechanisms that I'm not going to go into at all. I just want to mention that they're there. There are a variety of mechanisms that help you shape the flow of data throughout your stream. These pictures I'm showing are very, very simple. Traditional streams that are actually running in practice tend to be very complex and they have a variety of things going in and out. And it becomes very, very quickly some part of your system breaks. And you want some ability to, to protect those parts of the system. And Streams provides those mechanisms. Okay. Uh, streams are easy to extend. This is verbatim. I think I chopped off the doc string, but this is verbatim the map class in Streams. This is the filter class. Uh, these are simple only because we worked fairly hard to make them simple. And I rewrote this thing a few times before I got to a point where I was happy with it. So if Streams doesn't do something you like, uh, it's fairly easy to build your own. Uh, if you want to understand time processing, like rate limiting, you need to know a little bit of Tornado. Uh, Tornado is a common framework for, work for concurrent programming. Or if you prefer async IO side of things. So, okay. Uh, next, I want to talk about data frames. So uh, you can imagine having a stream where all of the elements passing through that stream were not you know, dictionaries or lists, but were themselves pandas data frames. And you might want to build algorithms on top of those pandas data frames. Right. So for example, if I wanted to compute something like uh, you know, sub subset only where the name is Alice, take the x column and compute the sum, I can do that with these map and accumulate functions. So I can map over my stream and select only those data frames, only those rows of my data frames, for which the name column is Alice. I could make an accumulator, which took off the x column and computed the sum. And this would give me the same semantics, the same results, so I sort of wanted to write down in pandas, uh, but would give that to me uh, in a streaming updatable way. So let's go and see that. So let's make some batches. I got the records. Uh, so I don't want to make a pandas data frame for every dictionary passing through my stream. That will be inefficient. Pandas only works really well when you have a lot of rows. So I'm going to collect uh, all of those records that come in and say maybe 300 milliseconds. Then I'm going to take those batches. I'm going to map lists on them because pandas data frames are a little bit, a little bit finicky. There we go. So we now have a stream of pandas data frames. Okay. And here's that code that we, we just saw from before in the slides. Okay. So here we're computing the sum of the x column of all of the rows that were uh, named Alice. Now, that can get kind of tricky, especially if you want to do more complex operations, like group by operations, or windowed systems, or rolling averages. That can get difficult. Uh, so uh, we built a bunch of those algorithms for you. So there's the streams.dataframe uh, system. And what this does, it takes in a normal stream of pandas data frames, 
And it gives you an object that looks and feels a lot like a pandas data frame. So this object is not a pandas data frame, it's a streaming data frame, but it looks very similar. So again, we have this, this desire to compute this, this result here. And we, we did that above, right, by making a mapping function, making an aggregation function. We do that now with the streaming data frame API. And we're going to do it uh, like this. So we're, we're satisfying a, a good subset of the Pandas API. So it's the exact same code we would have from Pandas. It now just works in a streaming way. Uh, that again becomes more valuable when you do want to do something more complex. Let's say you want a window by five seconds. You want to group by the name. We want to compute the mean of the X and Y columns. Actually, I hope that works. That is because this is not a time series data frame. Okay, hold on. I need to do one thing. I'll fix things. Uh, df of time equals df dot time dot as type. So this is actually just showing you that a lot of the pandas API works. So I need to make this index a daytime index in order to do daytime processing like windowed operations. There we go. It looks much nicer. Now, I can add windowing support to this data frame. Much nicer. OK. So the system handles a fair amount of the Pandas API. It does windowing operations, group by operations, reductions, filters, etc. Not all of it. Lots of things the Pandas can do, this can't do. But a fair amount it can. Also, one of my sort of favorite features uh, was added actually by Philip Rudiger just uh, this last weekend, is that you can take this exact same command and you can plot that using, again, just the pandas plotting API. Oh, let's get... Um, much nicer. So this integrates with Bokeh and Hall of Views to give you streaming plots off of your data frames. And again, this is built on sort of the standard core of the stream system, which handles a variety of piping. So all of these things we've done in the Jupyter Notebook aren't what you normally do with streaming systems. Normally, you build plots. You build systems that are going to trigger to email someone, to trigger some fraud API, et cetera. Uh, but you can imagine building those into proper applications, like what we saw in the beginning with that dashboard with network data. All of the things that we built here, all of the different things that are plotting out data for us, that's depicted here in this, in this plot. Okay. So each, each little circle at the end here is probably resulting in some Jupyter cell being updated whenever we push data in here at the beginning. And Streams is managing all of that administrative, administrative stuff for you. Okay. Back to slides. Okay, so we've seen that you could do these sorts of things with map and accumulate uh, with Streams core. And Streams data frame is just syntactic sugar on top of that, just to give you a pandas like experience in a nice way. You can do more complex things, which is pleasant. You can also do, give you nice things like plotting. Uh, this plotting is using the Bokeh library for interactive plots. Hall of Views to do all of the, uh, the nice shaping of those plots. Uh, and this was added by Philip Rudiger, um, again, this weekend. So many thanks to him. <coughs> so as you saw, this integrates nicely with Jupyter Notebook. It's using standard Jupyter Notebook's IPython widgets, uh, which I highly recommend people, people use. They're very, very productive if you want to make nice interactive things in notebooks. This was not that hard. This is literally adding the live updates for these with something like 10 to 20 lines of code. I'm not saying that streams is cool, I'm saying that IPython widgets are cool, and you should consider using them. Same with Bokeh. Okay, 
So uh, we've spoken a bit about uh, misbuilt data frames. Spoken a bit about streaming systems and data frames. Uh, and all of that was happening on a single core on my laptop in my Jupyter Notebook session. I didn't set anything up. There was no extra service I was connecting to. It was just happening in Python locally. It's not scalable, but you can process you know, gigabytes per second with a single thread on your, your computer. So if you are careful about things, that can be enough for you. One of my goals with streams was to make it simple in simple cases. Uh, and so you don't need to know a tornado. You just need to do basic operations. And you can handle a fair amount of computation. That being said, my job is to make Python scale well. Uh, so let's look at, at Dask. So again, Dask is known for things like parallelizing NumPy, parallelizing pandas, parallelizing parts of scikit-learn, uh, concurrent futures like what we saw before. Uh, but Dask is more commonly used in production for parallelizing other stuff. So you know, research groups or industries or, or enterprise have their own system inside of their company they want to parallelize. And they throw away all the data frame stuff. They throw away all the NumPy stuff. And they just use the engine that's powering that. And Dask has been very commonly used to power other stuff. So the question arises, can it power the streams library that we just built? Right? The answer is yes. There is a streams.dask module, which contains a Dask stream object, which is more or less a drop-in replacement for the normal stream object. So anything I just, everything I just showed works just fine with Dask, uh, with some caveats. Um, Dask is very nice to use in your single machine, just to use all of your cores. It's very lightweight. It also scales out to thousands of machines if you want it to. Uh, the Dask streams bit was very easy to write. We based it on top of the current, current futures module, and it took around 200 lines of code to do map and accumulate and some other things. Uh, OK, so if you have some existing stream, like, like this guy, you can use the Dask stream implementation by uh, creating a client uh, and then just introducing scatter and gather calls at appropriate places. So on the line A2, we are deciding to parse this data locally. Then we scatter that out to the cluster. So the, the cluster's cores are now going to be using that. And those may just be our local cores. And that'll be doing a lot of processing after that. Oops. And then we want to go local. We call gather. And this brings us back from a Dask stream back to a local stream. So you can mix and match going out to the cluster, coming back in a fairly easy way. And your code doesn't have to change a whole lot. So let's go look at an example. So I'm going to make a tiny Dask cluster on my local laptop. This is running with, with threads locally. And I'm going to create a uh, just random source of time series data. When Dask starts up, it starts up this nice dashboard. And so this data is creating every 100 milliseconds, it's making a new pandas data frame with about, about 20 rows. And so each bar you see here on the right is one of our threads was asked to compute that random data frame, and it's living on that, on that core, wherever it is. Now let's go and look at that data. And so now, you know, Dask has to do more work, has to pick off the tail of that data, has to accumulate some things. Um, so you see there's more things happening here on the right. And we can do, you know, some aggregations. And, and Dask will again, you know, pick up some more, more work. It looks like there's a fair amount happening here, but actually these computations are relatively fast. So if you zoom in, there's actually a lot of, a lot of white space. So this is not at all stressing, stressing our system. And you can do all the nice things we did before, like time series plots. So here, rolling averages over time. Okay, that's nice. It's relatively snappy. Dask just add a little bit of latency onto these things. Uh, but it's nice, and it's running the exact same code now using many cores on my laptop. And it would be trivial to extend this onto a cluster. Literally, I would just change the address here at the top that I would, I would running, on, running on. So I would type in you know, some, some scheduler address. And that's what I would need to do to run this instead of a cluster, instead of my local machine. So that is the extent of the Dask talk within this talk. Everything more or less just works. We implemented an API, and we implemented the same API with Dask, and it wasn't that hard. Okay. Uh, so performance is interesting. I care a lot about performance. Uh, streams adds overhead. 
right? Using a simple Python for loop is much faster than using streams. It's something like 10 to 100 times faster than the streams. So Python iterators have sort of a, you know, 10 to 100 nanosecond overhead. You can do, you know, many millions of things in Python in a second. Streams has sort of a microsecond to 10 microsecond overhead. So you can do, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of things per second with streams. Uh, that's still relatively fast compared to many things, uh, but it might be slow relative to what you're doing. Compare this to pandas, making a pandas data frame takes, you know, something like a millisecond. Uh, so if you're using stream, uh, streams data frames, you know, all of your operations should certainly take longer than a millisecond, otherwise pandas will slow you down. Dask adds an additional overhead of something like 200 microseconds per core. So if you're trying to saturate, say, 100 cores, your task should take somewhere in the vicinity of 20 milliseconds to be of any use. So there's certainly some, some loss of performance as you scale, uh, but that is, is still relatively small, and all of those numbers are well below human response times. So if you are making dashboards, everything in this stack is relatively, relatively snappy. Interestingly, so if you actually look at what's slowing things down here in these plots. And if you notice, but I was running through my notebook, things were getting a little bit more sluggish. It's actually the Jupyter Notebook in many cases, if you, if you benchmark things. Uh, changing 20 notebook cells every you know, 10 or 20 hertz is actually somewhat hard on the Jupyter Notebook protocol. Uh, we haven't, I, that's probably on my end, not on their end, but uh, there's probably some things we can, we can optimize there. Okay, what doesn't work? So again, this is very new. Uh, this is a nights and weekends project for the last few months. Maybe it'll be start being a more th bigger thing now. Um, so convenient data source integration. There's some Kafka support, not a whole lot. I've played with Kafka very easily on my own, but it's sort of not in a nice, pleasant way. Uh, out of order data frame handling for time. There's really no benchmarking or profiling. And there's other sort of issues that happen. Mostly, why I'm here, not talking about DAS, but talking about this. So I would love for you guys to try this out. Uh, and raise issues and maybe you know, contribute, or maybe just say that it's good or useful in certain domains or not useful in certain domains. That'd be very helpful. So this is my plea to you all to engage. This is a very young project. There's a lot of very low-hanging fruit to do in this project. So if you want to become active as a developer, it's a great way to start. It's much easier than like say contributing to NumPy, which is very, very solidified. This is very young, it's very pleasant to work on. Uh, and that's it. Um, so yeah, any questions? Are we roving mics or just repeating questions? Whoever's repeating questions. Question in the back. Uh, this, the domain of this project is certainly of interest to many enterprise companies, and so it is something that Anaconda cares about. That being said, I can't speak for Anaconda in supporting this project seriously in the future. Okay, uh, if you work for a company and you really need streaming processing, and you talk to Anaconda saying, hey, that streaming thing is really cool, then the answer might be yes. Well, it depends on you all again. So this is very much a grounds up project. Yeah, so the question is how does scatter and gather work with back pressure when you actually distribute streams? So how scatter works is it's just using the Dask scatter mechanism. So if you have a client and you scatter something out, that goes to whatever worker it thinks is a good worker at the time. And Dask is clever about that thinking process. One thing at the time. So you should probably think about the granularity of, of what you're scattering before you scatter it. You don't want to be scattering a stream that has millions of things running through it a second. You want to do some sort of aggregation ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, you know, ideally, you would scatter file names, something that's small but leads to a big thing. Or you would scatter you know, ranges in a Kafka queue that say, oh, yeah, yeah, the you know, offsets 1,000 to 10,000, or 1,000 to 1,000. Uh, those should be sent to this worker to do some work on it. Uh, gathering is the same thing. Eventually, those things that are moving around are Dask futures. And when you gather those, they're just coming back to your, they're just calling client.gather on them. Uh, there are things in streams to control the ordering as you care. So you can, again, as I said, there's a lot of things to shape time and shape uh, flow control, and you can shape ordering as well. Yeah, it's a good question. That guy uses Dask, obviously, in the task scheduling way. <laughs> Other questions? 
Uh, one question there. How does scanner and gather affect your visualization? Do you see those when you visualize? Uh, so the question is, how does scatter and gather affect the visualization? Uh, yeah, so when you visualize, do I have another thing up here? Yeah, so this is the Dask dashboard on the right, and it has a variety of, of things going on in it. Um, so you would see things here like, you know, the bytes stored on every worker, or, you know, the kind of things that are in memory over time. Uh, you might also see, you know, the amount of memory increase on those workers as things arrive. Um, this is showing you the system monitor of all of the, the Dask scheduler. This is showing you a distributed profile of, of the Dask worker. If that shows up, we'll see. Um, so Dask generally does give you feedback about when things do scatter, um, but it's not gonna, it doesn't show up in this original plot, if that's your question. Question over there? Which is, have I run this production setting against streams that have millions of events? The answer is no, I have not. Uh, the, there are two active use cases that I know about. Uh, one is at Brookhaven National Labs. So the keynote this morning, there's a research group working in exactly that same space who's using streams to do a lot of image processing. I think there's more of a research group than like what the entire lab is running on, so it's, it's small. Uh, there's also some finance people running on it, I think, again, as a small research thing. I don't, can't see who they are. But, uh, but no, I have not personally run this at scale at all, but I would love for you to do that. Okay. There's another question over here somewhere? Question? Yeah, how would I compare these to contemporary uh, streaming frameworks like Flink, Apache Flink, uh, Spark Streaming, and Apache Beam? Those are all way more mature and, and way more solid than this, first of all. Um, things where you might prefer this over that. Uh, this is lighter weight. It's Pythonic. Beam has a Python API, sort of. Spark Streaming has a Python A that mostly just leads to, to Java. Um, this also, I, I believe, although please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the amount of control you have here at a finer level is, is, some, is slightly more than what you'll find out of something like Flink or, or Beam or Spark Streaming. This is somewhere in between the Flink space and like the zero MQ space. Um, but again, uh, if you're actually building something in production today, do not use this. You should use Flink or Spark Streaming or Beam. Yeah, the question is can I replace all of my pandas data frame code with streams data frame code and will it still work? The answer is no. Because uh, pan your, pandas, your pandas code invariably contains some small corner of the pandas API that this does not support. This supports a common subset, but everybody who uses pandas uses it in a very different way. Uh, so, if you're, so our experience with Dask data frames, which do support a very broad set, subset of pandas, that is, it has been a long time to build up all of that API and discover what everyone uses. This implements a very, very small, small subset. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, question is, have I done this with any sort of online learning, like with partial fits? And yeah, partial fit, so answer is no, uh, but you could. Uh, and partial fit is, is, is very much falls into this very nicely, right? it's very much an accumulated function. That being said, online learning is a tricky subject, and you should be aware of how you're mixing data, what you're holding on to. So you need to know about machine learning to do that well, but streams can certainly be a, a tool to help you do that. Okay. okay, going once, going twice, sold. Thank you all for your time. I'll be around. <laughs>